The family doctor whose duty was to preserve life confirmed now as a mass murderer the full extent of his crimes as yet unknown. Dr. Harold Frederick Shipman of Hyde, Manchester, murdered 215 of his patients over a 20-year period. His reputation as a caring GP in a close-knit town was a thin veil for his evil killings. He committed the ultimate betrayal in patient doctor trust and callously murdered with lethal injection, making this a crime that shook Britain. It's the last thing that you would expect is a well-respected doctor in a small town you know, might be killing his patients. A man who exercised the ultimate power of controlling life and death. As far as he was concerned, he was a doctor. Uh, it wasn't for people to question what he had done, and it certainly wasn't a, a matter for the police to be questioning him about. Even when everything came out, people still couldn't believe it was Dr. Shipman. The prosecution alleged that the high GP enjoyed killing his patients. Whenever Mum spoke about Shipman, he was a wonderful man and he was very caring and very loyal and did whatever he could. And it seemed very odd that all of a sudden when she died, he turned into this monster. Harold Shipman ran a busy one-man surgery in a town of 22,000 people. His patients held him in high regard. But Shipman held an unimaginable secret, one that goes against the oath of any doctor. He was killing his patients. In 1998, his cover was blown, and two years later, he was convicted of murdering 15 patients. Dr. Shipman is now the biggest single mass murderer the world has ever seen. After he was finally accused, of 215 killings. When I met Dr. Shipman, he wasn't a particularly friendly person. He was uh, quite arrogant and aloof most of the time with his fellow doctors. He reduced uh, a rep from a pharmaceutical company to tears because he was just so aggressive in, in the way he was dealing with her. Shipman was very respected in the community um, with families, patients and other professional people. Mum was always over the moon about how wonderful he was, how well he treated my dad, how well he treated my mum, uh, what a, a brilliant doctor he was. And I was always, blimey, this came across as a bit of a superman. This film will tell the story of serial killer Harold Shipman through the eyewitness accounts of his colleagues from the other local practice and the relatives forced to live with his crimes. November 1997. Dr. Shipman is conducting house calls. Today, he is visiting Marie Quinn, a 67-year-old local lady who has been a loyal patient of his for 20 years. Shipman claims to find Marie unconscious and takes the decision not to resuscitate. He apparently makes a call to a loved one, delivering the devastating news that she has died of a stroke. We received a call to say that Mrs. Quinn had passed away at home. We were told that um, we couldn't move her body at the time because there was nobody in the house to let us in. Therefore, we had to wait until after Shipman's surgery had closed and he was going to let us in. Shipman has a reputation for visiting his elderly patients at home. So when Debbie receives a call from his surgery, it isn't unusual. But today, something seems amiss. We took Mrs Quinn to the Chapel of Rest, but we couldn't quite understand um, why he had a key to let us into the house. Hello, the funeral directors have started to feel uneasy about some of Shipman's deceased patients. Certain elements just aren't adding up, and now more alarm bells are ringing. His wife was also with him. Um, which wasn't normal, but um, we were told that she was there to take the cat away. Shipman certifies the death from a stroke, 
paperwork is filed and family and friends are left to mourn. Marie didn't appear to be ill, but the expert has given his opinion. Life in Hyde continues. But on the 10th of December, another patient of shipment dies suddenly at her home. Bianca Pomfret is just 49 years old. She lived alone uh, and had done for some years. Uh, for many years she'd suffered from depression. The day before, when uh, the support worker had spoken to her, she had been well and had not been complaining of any condition, uh, certainly any serious condition. Bianca thought very highly of her doctor and was well known at his surgery. But her medical complaints were not life-threatening. Now she lies dead. Yet apart from her frequent ailments, she hasn't complained of any other conditions. On the day that she died, uh, she'd been seen by a neighbour. Later on that day, uh, one of her support workers uh, called her to home, uh, knocked on the door and couldn't get any reply. As a result of that, she contacted uh, Bianca's son, who came round. Um, they got access to the house, found that the door in actual fact was unlocked, and they found Bianca sat in a chair, uh, dead, uh, fully dressed. Here is another death that doesn't add up. In the following months, the funeral directors grow increasingly concerned. More of Shipman's patients are found in unusual circumstances. By February 1998, Debbie is compelled to share their concerns. We were a bit uneasy really with um, the numbers of his patients that were dying at home and the majority of them were always women. We didn't quite know who to talk to so I made a decision one day when Dr Booth came to our chapel of rest to sign some cremation forms to have a word with her. She was worried that the way that they were being found they were didn't seem as though they'd been lying in bed ill. They weren't in their night clothes, they were sat in a chair fully dressed and said, don't you, you think that you're coming to do too many of, to countersign too many of Shipman's forms? It could be that they died at home quite peacefully and naturally. But on the other hand, if, if things weren't quite right, then I'd, I'd, we needed to speak to somebody, we needed to reach out to someone. I was quite shocked as well at what she might be suggesting, um, that she was suggesting that Dr Shipman might be killing his patients. A number of patients now lie dead with no previous major ill health. And the doctor with one of the best reputations in medicine is now under scrutiny. Really, my first memory was when uh, Sue Booth came knocking very, very agitated. Unfortunately, um, Dr Patel was in surgery. He was just, just as horrified and shocked as I was, you know, and. I thought, well, we have to discuss it with the whole partnership together and decide what we're going to do. The undertakers had made some remarks about, uh, about Shipman, which she had found very uh, upsetting and, and also very alarming, and that she really wasn't sure what to do next. More alarming news is about to follow, as Sue Booth is called upon once more. That weekend Dr Reynolds rang me at home and said she had suspicions about Dr Shipman being uh, a murderer and she was very concerned and she wanted to discuss it anyway. As the GPs at the neighbouring practice call an urgent meeting, Shipman goes about his daily duties. Unaware he is under suspicion, he is again conducting house calls. Today, he is visiting one of his loyal patients, 77-year-old Ada Warburton. She was a fanatical pressure cooker person. <laughs> she was really well-nourished and a fruit and veg fanatic. She took really good care of herself. Shipman has made an unannounced visit to Ada, but she welcomes him in regardless. Meanwhile, Raj, Sue and colleagues voice their growing concerns. Normally we had our practice meetings on the premises, but 
because of the sensitive nature of the discussion, we decided that we'd hold it away from Hyde, so we met in a, in a pub in Heaton Moor. Harold Chitton told me that Auntie Ada had been in contact with him. She wondered if she'd had a stroke. Can I, can I ask you to roll your sleeves up? Right. It won't take long anymore, it won't be me. And he then said that he would go and check on her later in the day. We knew there was a discrepancy, but one which simply seemed to be anecdotal and observed by people rather than anything based on numbers or figures. We then discussed whether we were talking about possibly uh, some kind of professional incompetence or some kind of malpractice. Linda at that point said, well, she thought that he was perhaps deliberately harming his patients. And this was just um, a turning point, I think, for all of us. Once somebody has made that statement, there is no going back. He told me that he had found my telephone number by routing through the bureau when he had come across her will. He'd found my name in her will and he continued routing then until he'd found an address book with my telephone number. We decided that one of the doctors would look at our number of deaths in the previous two years in the practice and compare it with the number of certification requests we'd had from Dr. Shipman. If a person wants one of their relatives to be cremated, um, you need a cremation certificate which has to be signed by two doctors. He never told me anything. It was really weird. And then he said that um, he thought she'd had a stroke. At this stage, I had to stop him and say, well, where is she now? You know, is she in the hospital? Did it not amount to anything? Is she at home? And he then told me that she passed away. A few days later, the doctors nervously await the results. They urgently need to analyse the death rates between their surgery and Shippen's across the road. Then the figures come through. They, they were just astounding that uh, there were something like 41 occasions when Shipman had asked us to countersign cremation forms uh, over, uh, over many months. And during the same period of time, uh, we had only had 14 deaths from around 10,000 10, people. You know, you, at the back of your mind you're thinking, well this can't be true, it can't be true that a doctor is killing his patients, it's just unbelievable. March 1998. Officers from Greater Manchester Police launch an investigation into the allegations against Harold Shipman. GPs from a surgery just 20 yards away have discovered an alarming number of deaths from his practice and decide to contact police via the coroner. We were entirely prepared to be wrong at the time. And I think certainly Linda probably felt more acutely aware of this than anybody else that she, here she was coming from outside of Hyde uh, into an area where she had only been practicing for a short time and she was challenging somebody else's reputation. Despite the doctor's reservations, matters have to be investigated. D.I. Smith is assigned to the case. His first port of call is Dr. Lorda Reynolds. He heads over to book surgery. The rest of us only worked in Hyde and only our limited experience of working with Dr. Shipman across the road as a, as a neighbouring doctor, was Linda had come to us from another practice in Reddish and, and certainly her experience about doing uh, cremation forms was that she was doing far more for Dr. Shipman since she had arrived in Hyde than she had been at her previous practice. She also found it suspicious that he'd been present at quite a few of the deaths. We really did not want any of this to be true. 
Uh, we, we genuinely wanted somebody just to look at the difference in death rates and simply to say these differences were entirely understandable. As D.I. Smith and Dr. Reynolds discussed the concerns, one of Shipman's patients, 88-year-old Martha Marley, has just come off the phone to her daughter. It was the habit of her daughter to actually telephone her mother around about 9 o'clock each morning and around about 6 o'clock each evening. Her daughter rang her as usual around about 9 o'clock. Her mother didn't complain of any illness. Uh, she seemed uh, well uh, and bright. Uh, and she arranged then to ring her uh, mother later on in the day as usual. But later that day, routine is broken as Martha's daughter struggles to contact her. Meanwhile, Shipman takes open surgery at his clinic. Whilst across the road, police are being told he might be murdering his patients. It is the details from this initial meeting that determine the nature of the rest of D.I. Smith's inquiry. From his time with Dr. Reynolds, he doesn't place importance on vital information. The relevance of a second doctor signing a cremation form. The availability of a body to autopsy. The difference between the death rates at the two surgeries. And the relevance of interviewing any other doctor at the practice. But this is a unique case, and Smith isn't experienced in this kind of investigation. Now, as D.I. Smith leaves Brook Surgery, Dr. Shipman is busy with his other patients. At 6.45 p.m., Martha Marley is found dead at her home. The paramedics were uh, summoned to uh, Martha's home uh, and obviously found that she had died. Um, the cause of death uh, given uh, by Shipman subsequently was that she had died from old age. A body now lies in the morgue with similar characteristics of other patient deaths. Alone, at home, and with no major health complaints. But the investigation heads in another direction, and doctors at Brook Surgery carry on as normal. Police haven't advised to do anything different should another death occur. But just two days later, another cremation form arrives from Shipman. I was far more aware that this particular death may well be under police scrutiny. As the investigation gets underway and Martha Marley's body waits to be put to rest, another of Shipman's recently deceased patients, Ada Warburton, who Shipman visited six days ago, now also lies dead. When I was told that she had died, I was absolutely stunned. I was stunned because I spoke to her very often and had she been ill she would have mentioned it. Two bodies could now hold the key to Shipman's crimes, but this avenue remains undetected. D.I. Smith instead turns his attention to the town hall to discover how many deaths have been registered by Shipman in the last six months. It appears that um, in searching registers uh, that some of the uh, deaths were actually missed and there was a smaller number actually given to D.I. Smith than uh, in actual fact Shipman had been involved in. Police are led to believe they are dealing with a lower number of potential deaths than is the case. Discreet investigations continue. All the while, Shipman goes about his duties as normal. And two potential victims lie in the mortuary, about to be cremated. Dr. Reynolds believes these might hold the vital clues needed. He had mentioned at one point to CID that, that there were two bodies at the undertakers uh, that could have been examined by post-mortem. Linda thought that the police would be looking into that, just as a normal follow-up to that inquiry. I'm now uh, of the opinion that, uh, that the police didn't look at that. When Shipman phoned me on the Friday night when he told me that Auntie Ada had died, he told me that he'd inform the police because the house had to be secured. So whilst he was speaking to me, the policeman actually came into the room. The policeman took the telephone from Shipman and 
he was the first to mention post-mortem. In less than 10 seconds, it was quite apparent that Shipman had somehow he'd managed to tell him that this wouldn't be necessary. No autopsies have been ordered. Vital evidence could be lost forever. Later that day, Ada Warburton is cremated. Anyone who knows me knows that had I been discreetly asked to give permission for post-mortem, I wouldn't have liked it, but I would have gone along with it to help an investigation. The coroner nor D.I. Smith is aware of Ada's death. They are also unaware of Martha Marley's death, who was cremated the very next day. It is now one week into the investigation. D.I. Smith needs to see if there are any discrepancies in the deaths registered by Shipman. He decides to visit Dr. Banks at the West Pennine Health Authority. Dr. Banks deals with complaints about health practitioners in the area. Dr. Banks' opinion was that there was nothing out of the ordinary with those uh, notes and the action that was taken by Dr. Shipman. It may well have reassured him that there was no uh, medical evidence to suggest that Shipman had been involved in the deaths of these individuals. Shipman, on the other hand, seemed to have, uh, appeared to have, a lot of elderly patients and retired people. And again, this seemed to indicate that they were, there were differences in what he would experience and what we would experience. If police were to search Shipman's practice profile, they discover he has a less than average list of elderly patients and a smaller percentage of females than any other practice in Thameside, blowing the myth that most of his patients are old and female. The chance for autopsies has now passed, and to D.I. Smith, there appears to be nothing of concern in Shipman's records. But before closing the case, D.I. Smith visits the local cemetery to look into the number of cremations. What he wanted from there was uh, details of the undertakers that had been involved in the uh, burying or in the cremation of individuals in order that he could conduct inquiries. Meanwhile, Debbie Massey, the funeral director who first raised the alarm, hasn't been contacted about the deaths. We were surprised that we hadn't been interviewed um, and asked questions on our concerns. Relatives of the deceased are also unaware Shipman may have killed their loved ones. At the time of Auntie Ada's death, I knew absolutely nothing of the rumours of the police investigation. Afterwards, of course, with hindsight, it's very easy to say, if I'd have been there, I'd have said I want a post-mortem. You can't say that. I had no, no need to ask for one, no reason to ask for one, because I didn't really understand um, why they should be, why it should be necessary. Police who attended some of the deaths haven't been contacted either. No checks have been made on the police national computer or with the General Medical Council to see if Shipman has any previous criminal history. If D.I. Smith were to look, he'd discover Shipman is a man with a sketchy past. Shipman was convicted uh, of um, offences relating to his abuse of pethidine. Uh, what he was doing was obtaining drugs Ill illicitly by forging uh, orders which he was then using to inject uh, himself. Uh, he was convicted at the uh, local magistrate's court and received a heavy fine. Although the General Medical Council took the view at that stage that no punishment should be uh, imposed on him by themselves. He received a period of treatment uh, and uh, resumed practice around about six months later. A vital piece of the jigsaw is missing. Police are unaware they are dealing with a man with a history of drug abuse. Possible victims have been cremated. Tests may have revealed high levels of diamorphine. But the case is closed. I just breathed a huge sigh of relief at the time. Just thought, you know, I just thought that was um, good news as far as I was concerned, as I really didn't want there to be any truth in any of those observations. Dr Reynolds was still unhappy with the outcome of the investigation, so we agreed that we would just keep a close eye on the situation, but 
the bottom line had to be that the police said everything was okay. Police seem convinced the popular GP is guilty of nothing more than caring for his patients. But Dr. Shipman goes on to kill three more women. Three months have passed since police investigated claims that Dr. Shipman was murdering his patients. His colleagues were on edge while Shipman remains in practice and seemingly untouchable. Today, he is visiting the home of Mrs. Kathleen Grundy, the former mayoress of Hyde. It is 8.30 a.m. and he has allegedly come to take a blood sample. She was a lovely lady, a really lovely lady. Um, very friendly, uh, extremely friendly with my mum. Despite the fact that she was in her early 80s, she helped to serve meals to the elderly. She was certainly very active in that whenever I saw her, she was always very well and she was always another one who rushed around everywhere. It's a busy day for Kathleen. She's an active woman who rises early and gets on with her day. In a few hours time, she's due at the community centre to help out as usual, but finds time for Dr Shipman beforehand. It is now 11.55 a.m. and friends John Green and Ronald Pickford are concerned Kathleen hasn't shown up at the luncheon club. They make the short walk to Joel Lane to check on her. They found her door unlocked, they went inside uh, because there was no answer to repeated knocking and they found Kathleen dead on a settee uh, in the lounge, fully dressed. Dr. Shipman is called out immediately and certifies Kathleen's death as old age. Her family and friends, although massively shocked by the sudden death, pay tribute to her the following week. She's laid to rest at Hyde Chapel, near to her parents. But Kathleen's legacy doesn't end here. Her message from beyond the grave is about to blow the lid on the country's biggest serial killer. Angela Woodruff was contacted by Hamilton Ward solicitors only a few days after her uh, mother's burial and tell her that uh, they were in possession of a will allegedly made by her mother in which um, all her assets had been left to Dr. Shipman. Kathleen's daughter Angela is left baffled by the news. Why leave a legacy to someone who wasn't particularly close? After a copy of the will is faxed through, Angela, a solicitor herself, heads straight to Hyde to investigate further. In the body of the um, will, it talks about leaving my house. In actual fact, her mother owned two houses and obviously would have known that. So consequently, had she genuinely prepared that will, she would have talked about two houses. The general uh, condition of the will, the way it had been prepared, uh, it looked uh, very, very amateurish. Kathleen Grundy uh, had been a very particular individual, very neat uh, person, and um, in actual fact hand-wrote everything. Having uh, seen the documents, Angela uh, became uh, extremely concerned. She decided that before she went to the police, she would make some inquiries of her own. One of the things that she did was to get out the paying in slips for the age concern shop where Kathleen Grundy did the paying in. She wanted to compare the signatures on that with the signatures supposedly being made by her mother on the will. The signatures don't match. Angela needs to probe further. When she quizzes witnesses on the document, her fears grow. Several days before he killed her, he actually got two members of the public who were sitting waiting in the waiting room to come into his surgery to sign a form. They believe that that was uh, probably an insurance proposal form, something similar. What he said was uh, that uh, it was uh, probably an insurance form. She asked him to sign it. He wouldn't get involved in anything like that, so he asked two members of the public. If that's the case, he would never have seen the, the will form and he would never have touched it. But his fingerprints were on it. Kathleen had also been a picture of health shortly before her death, chatting with an old friend. Her meticulous diary showed she was expecting Shipman on that day to take a blood sample. Subsequent inquiries uh, revealed that no such survey was taking place. 
uh, and in, in fact uh, in respect of Shipman's explanation um, the blood sample that he allegedly took that morning um, did not turn up it had not been sent to the pathology lab and it, still, and it wasn't still in his surgery for a second time Harold Shipman comes to police attention and now the devastating facts are going to be irrefutable no blood was taken from Mrs Grundy Shipman's elaborate plan is about to be foiled he has callously murdered Kathleen and tried to forge her will to inherit nearly four hundred thousand pounds there was a headline on Radio 4 a Tameside doctor accused of murder and forging a will as soon as I heard that news report I was convinced he was guilty of my mum's death it's a cold summer evening in Hyde Manchester police take the dramatic decision to exhume the body of Kathleen Grundy detective superintendent Bernard Postles now leads the case they fear Kathleen has been killed by her GP Harold Shipman whispers in town are now in overdrive has the doctor with over 3,000 patients been killing those who gave him their unquestionable trust by the 1st of August uh, only five days after Angela expressed her concerns we exhumed the body of her mother uh, forensic tests uh, needed to be carried out in addition to that um, the typewriter had been recovered from Dr. Shipman's surgery which we believed had been used to prepare the will and the letter that accompanied it. Mid-August, Shipman is well aware he is under suspicion for murder and forgery, but he carries on regardless, seeing patient after patient and even joking with those he treats. Whilst officers swoop on his surgery to seize other potential evidence, he shows only contempt for the inconvenience caused. There appear to be further new concerns somewhere along the line that we haven't been involved with but clearly you know somebody is looking into this again. We thought we'd put it all behind us and then now it's starting again and of course the horrific numbers that were going to come out subsequently we had no idea it was going to be as big as that. The town of Hyde, Manchester is in turmoil. Dr. Harold Shipman, one of its most popular GPs, is under police scrutiny, suspected of murder. Officers have now exhumed a body for tests, and property has been seized from Shipman's home and surgery. September 1998. Dr. Harold Frederick Shipman is arrested. To avoid a media scrum, they allow him to make his own way to Ashton Police Station with a solicitor. The police now have damning evidence. The results came back from the toxicology tests, indicating that uh, it was diamorphine that was in Kathleen Grundy's body. In terms of the will, uh, the tests that were carried out showed that the will had been prepared on the typewriter, uh, which was owned by Dr. Shipman, and that the signatures on it uh, were probably forgeries. Dr. Shipman's fabricated world is closing in but he still defiantly keeps his composure. He strongly believes he'll be released after questioning later that day, but he never steps out of custody again. Uh, he appeared in a confident um, manner uh, that this was perhaps an inconvenience to him, and uh, my belief is that uh, he fully expected to be leaving the police station within a few hours. The devastation and magnitude of Shipman's crimes is overbearing for the whole community. As Shipman is charged with Kathleen's murder, police decide to exhume further patients. Ironically, Shipman's surgery is flooded with support from some loyal patients, hoping this is nothing more than a witch hunt or terrible misunderstanding. He was so well respected in the town and well liked, the patients loved him. You know, they all wanted to be on his list. He was a very popular doctor. Harold Frederick Shipman. Harold Shipman has stood trial for the last four months. It became apparent something was about to happen. Um, and we got a whisper that they've come to a decision. It was getting more and more difficult to question the 
amount of evidence that seemed to be mounting up against him. Then he came to the first one of cremation, guilty. And then there was his big sigh, and then guilty of the next one. And the various relatives then, who were sat behind me, whose um, relatives had been cremated, it was, uh, it's wrong to say a sigh of relief. It's a relief, I think, that it was over. But a sigh of horror that their relative had been murdered. Shipman is convicted of 15 counts of murder and forging a will. Tight-lipped and defiant as ever, he is led away to start 15 life-term imprisonments and a concurrent four-year term for forgery. And I think, um, I think by that point all of us were expecting that he was going to be found guilty of, uh, of some of the deaths. Um, but it still came as an enormous shock to find that he was convicted of 15. My recommendation is that you should spend the remainder of your days in prison. He shows no remorse, nor gives any explanation. The fact that Shipman never spoke about the murders suits me fine. I had got no desire to listen to anything that that man had to say. Shipman's colleagues from Brooks Surgery and the funeral directors were right all along. From their first suspicions, it now transpires the doctor went on to kill three more women before finally being charged. When my sister phoned me to say, Mum's died, I had an appalling reaction. I said, you're joking. Well, of course, you don't joke on something like that. I just didn't know what to say because having seen her two days before in the picture of health, how could she die? You know, could, could we have prevented their deaths during that summer? You know, you feel terribly saddened for the families of those, those ladies. He was really cold, nasty, uh, rather derogatory about my mum saying that she'd been suffering from angina, she'd been a, a, an awkward, cantankerous old lady, she wouldn't take her tablets, and it's not his fault she died. And it seemed very odd that all of a sudden when she died, he turned into this monster. He was going out to harm the very people he was supposed to help. And that was probably the single lowest point for, for me personally. And to a certain degree, we we almost felt guilty by association. No comment. Dr. Shipman, we have reason to believe you have murdered Kathleen. The big downfall for Dr. Shipman, uh, in actual fact, was the way that he had actually maintained records. They weren't consistent. Uh, certainly the medical records which he had altered weren't consistent uh, with other records kept around about the time of the deaths, with the death certificates, with the cremation certificates. Uh, and with the actual paper uh, medical records. They weren't consistent uh, with the stories that he told uh, to members of families uh, or to uh, neighbours at the time. It was towards the end of the uh, interview in relation to the first death that he was faced with irrefutable evidence that he had altered computerised medical records that he uh, actually uh, broke down and from that point on was uncooperative. Uh, in any interviews that took place. No comment. People are also questioning the motive. Apart from forging a will, there appears to be no clear reason. Rumours that Shipman asked for a keepsake after a death are now rife, and some relatives report missing jewellery, but no answers are given. Shipman reveals nothing. Her sister, Aunt Esther, she bought her the most beautiful necklace and personally, this beautiful necklace was a thank you from one sister to another. And we've never seen that since Harold Shipman went through the Bureau. Uh, my mum's wedding ring wasn't on a finger. Um, but it was a band. It was a gold band. There's no way you could identify it with the dozens and dozens of other gold bands that we found. But that wasn't 
the, the, the motive for killing these people. It couldn't have been just for little bits of trinkets like that. That was just something he took after the event. Shipman has now been in prison for four years. In the aftermath of his trial, a full inquiry looked into the death of every single patient Shipman ever had, suspecting there to be more victims. And now the true horror comes to light. Uh, this was an enormous case. I don't think that um, there has ever been a case as large as this, uh, certainly in terms of the numbers of deaths. D to find out that the figure was well above 200, set at 215 at, uh, at the very least, if not more, was deeply, deeply crushing, and it really damaged my confidence as a doctor. I knew it was a lot. I had no idea it was going to run to the hundreds. Shipman's killing spree spanned more than 20 years. With his first victim, allegedly in 1975, Mrs. Eva Lyons. Despite the growing number of victims now coming to light, police decide not to press any more charges. 23 families um, had been in contact with the police and they understood that there would be a second trial. Um, when they discovered afterwards that there was to be no second trial, they were very angry. There were two reasons. One, the trial judge had said that the uh, sentence of life imposed on Harold Shipman would actually mean life and that he would never leave prison. The second reason was that the enormous publicity which had surrounded the trial meant that any future trial uh, could not be fair. They were particularly angered because they were notified of it by letter and if memory serves me right the letter was posted through their doors in the early hours of the morning and yet the story had clearly been released to the newspapers the day before. How could a serial killer go undetected for so long? Some would say the warning signs were there. But this is a calculating, dishonest man who fooled those who trusted him for over two decades. Shipman managed to obtain drugs dishonestly for years. His drugs bill at the surgery was also 60% above the health authority average. And as much as there were suspicions being aroused at the time, the level of trust that existed in doctors allowed him to dissipate these suspicions with relative ease and to deceive everyone around him, including myself, who he deceived over and over again. There were other families who just simply didn't believe that it was true um, and thought that the, the judge and the jury had got it wrong. And I think that even during the inquiry, and even after the report came out, there were still families who just didn't believe what they were hearing. As a result of the murders, the Shipman Inquiry made some major recommendations to the health authority in monitoring practitioners. There have been massive changes in regulation of doctors and health professionals since Shipman. Doctors now face a, a scheme of revalidation where they will have to undergo a kind of MOT style of, of check uh, to allow them to keep their uh, registration in order to practice as a doctor. There will also be systems put in place that allow uh, recording of concerns around um, behaviours, conduct, practice, the General Medical Council is now becoming a body which is far more concerned about the well-being of the public and its patients than the profession it previously represented. Will this ever prevent another shipman? He was a one-off. I don't think there'll ever be anyone like that again. I mean, obviously there are serial killers in various different types of life. He just had the access to kill people and maybe got away with it longer because he was a doctor. Impossible, I think, to stop somebody doing it again. What we can stop doing again is the fact you count it out 215 times. Over a 23-year period, Dr. Harold Shipman murdered 215 loyal patients by lethal injections. The true death toll could actually be closer to 500. Countless families are now left picking up the pieces from one man's actions and his betrayal of their trust. 
think the hardest thing for the families um, was actually thinking about um, their relative dying. Um, what was it that he said when he was injecting them with diamorphine? She's thought of pretty much every day. She's missed so much. There's an engagement in the family. There's a baby born. She's the first person everybody wanted to tell and she's not there. You, you can't afford to let bitterness and hatred dominate everything you do um, because you just become a bitter and twisted person yourself and, and, and Shipman's won. Harold Shipman committed suicide in Wakefield Prison in 2004. He never offered any explanation for his crimes. Procedures have been tightened up now but I wouldn't put money on it not happening again.